All right, welcome everyone to Accessibility and Inclusivity, Changing the Narrative for Talent with Disabilities. This panel brings together professionals from film and TV to talk about challenges and opportunities for disabled talent within the industry. And we'll also be talking about on-screen representation and the authentic experience that disabled storytellers bring to the table. And hopefully we'll also be identifying some steps that the industry can take to build on some of the great work that this talent has already been doing, as well as to make some new opportunities possible. Uh, I'm Angelo Moretta, and I'm gonna be moderating this panel. Uh, I'm gonna start with just a quick visual description of myself and my surroundings. Uh, I'm a white wheelchair user with black wavy hair, uh, a mustache and a short beard. Uh, I'm waving, wearing a navy uh, polo shirt and thick dark glasses. I'm sitting in an apartment with uh, some posters visible in the background, uh, some lights here and there, and a couch with a banana pillow, as well as a bookshelf behind me. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, um, I'm a film programmer uh, for the MNJCC. I host a, a series that's kind of a lecture and screening series on disability on film. I'm also a freelance film critic for places like Cinemascope, uh, The National Post, and The Walrus, and I'm a professor of English at Humber College. Although we're scattered across many territories today, I would like to acknowledge the lineage of Indigenous peoples in the territory known as Toronto, which is where I'm sitting. I'm speaking to you from the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit, the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat, the original keepers of this land. And I say this to practice gratitude for the land and also to pay respect to the lineage of indigenous peoples who have lived in right relations with this land for thousands of years. I'd also like to acknowledge that you might be joining us today from different places near and far and acknowledge the traditional caretakers of these lands. So whatever path has brought you to the land that you are currently on, I encourage you to reflect on your relationship to it today as well as to reflect on how your experiences with it may differ from those around you. It's a great honor for me to moderate this conversation with some really impressive disabled filmmakers and performers. And what I'm gonna do to start us off is to just introduce each of them one by one and to ask each of them to say hello and to quickly visually describe themselves and their surroundings. So I wanna start with Rodney Evans. Uh, Rodney is a Brooklyn-based filmmaker his first feature, Brother to Brother, won the Special Jury Prize at the Sundance Film Festival in 2004. In 2008, Rodney received a Guggenheim Fellowship. In 2020, Rodney was one of 20 inaugural recipients of the Disability Futures Fellowship, which was presented by the Ford and Andrew W. Mellon Foundations. His 2019 documentary, Vision Portraits, recently screened at the Whitney Museum in honor of the 30th anniversary of the passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So welcome, Rodney, and please say hello and describe yourself. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to participate in the panel. Um, as you said, I am coming to you from the land of the Lenape, um, Brooklyn, New York, and I am a black man with brown skin. I have uh, twists uh, on the top of my head and a fade on the sides. And I am currently wearing a black and red uh, plaid shirt. Um, I've got black, white, blank white walls behind me and an open door um, to let in some AC. <laughs> and, um, and again, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Rodney. Uh, we also have with us George Alavizos. Uh, George is a Toronto-based theater and screen actor and a graduate from the University of Toronto and Sheridan's Theater and Drama Studies program. Uh, he's appeared in TV shows such as Hudson and Rex and Star Trek Discovery, uh, and he's also an advocate for disabled actors and has, in fact, recently participated in an accessibility audit with ACTRA to improve accessibility in the entertainment industry in Canada. Uh, so please say hello and describe yourself, George. Hello, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I am a white male in a wheelchair. I have a short haircut with a fade on the side. Um, I am wearing a beige t-shirt uh, and behind me is a beige wall 
with a painting on one side and a candle holder on the, that side. And on the other side is my bed and my closet because I am in my bedroom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, George. Uh, we're also joined by Mustafa Alabzi. Mustafa is a deaf actor based in Regina. In 2019, he starred in season one of Netflix's Black Summer. Uh, and previously, he participated in the deaf performance group Deaf Crows Collective. So please say hello and describe yourself for us, Mustafa. Hello, Angelo. Thank you. My name is Mustafa. Uh, as you can see, I'm an actor. And I hope to be doing more of that in the future. I have relatively short hair on the top and, and a, blended on the sides. I'm wearing a long sleeve blue shirt with a small pattern. I have a small ring around my collar. I'm in a room that's largely white or beige, blank walls. You can't see a whole lot. And uh, I also have the window open to moderate the temperature. And I'm just sitting in front of a computer desk to allow me to participate in today's discussion. And yes, this is also a bedroom and you might be able to see the foot of them there. And uh, I do have lights in the room, so it's fairly bright and clear this morning, which is very important to me and most people in the deaf community. Mm -hmm. And I certainly recognize and acknowledge the indigenous persons whose land this is, and uh, I respect them and thank the panel for my participation. All right, thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, we also have with us Chris Kelly. Uh, Chris is a Toronto-based actor and Olympic associate producer for the CBC. Uh, he holds diplomas in interactive media arts and film from Assiniboine Community College and Toronto Film School. Uh, he's worked as a technical operator for CTV News Regina and has freelanced in film production. So please say hello and describe yourself, Chris. Hi, uh, it's great to see everyone here and thanks everyone for tuning in. I am a tall Caucasian man. I have uh, short brown hair. Uh, wearing a nice white dress shirt to make mom proud. And uh, yeah, I'm in my room. I'm sitting down in front of my monitor and uh, I don't have a door or window open and it is getting quite hot, uh, but that's okay. It's an old heritage building and adds character. So uh, thanks for having me and I'm glad to be here. All right, thank you so much, Chris. And thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. Um, Rodney, I wanna start this conversation by, by asking you a question about really who gets to tell stories about disability and, and really about the importance of having disabled filmmakers behind the camera. Um, Vision Portraits, as you know, as the title would suggest, I think is a really powerful work of portraiture that I think is invested in the creative process of blind and low vision artists, including yourself. And it strikes me really watching the film that it's really critical that you're telling your own story in the film, that you're kind of helping to unlock some of the other artists' stories as a result of disclosing your own story and, and, and sort of grounding it in the authenticity of your own lived experience as a filmmaker. Um, so I wonder if you could speak a bit about the importance of authentic stories that come from disabled artists as opposed to images and stories about disability that come primarily from outside of the disabled community. Sure. I mean, you know, I, I think with vision portraits, it was really important to me, um, uh, you know, making this film in, in a very personal way to acknowledge the fact that I have low vision as well. Um, I have a genetic condition called retinitis pigmentosa, which basically means that I have no peripheral vision. And it's sort of like looking through the uh, paper towel tube, if you will. Um, and so, you know, that, that is the way in which I approached the participants in the film that I, you know, that I was on this journey, um, trying to figure out how I would continue to make work, um, if my vision, um, was to deteriorate and I was interested in their, creative process as blind and low vision artists. So I was very upfront um, 
and transparent about my own disability and how it was affecting my creative process. And I think that um, allowed for a certain kind of honesty and trust and authenticity and vulnerability in the conversations that we were having with each other that um, comprise most of the film. Um, you know, there's one character who's an African-American woman named Kayla Hamilton, who's a dancer slash choreographer. And, you know, we've done a few panels together. And, you know, she often says, if Rodney wasn't directing this film, I, I would not have participated. So it was that, that meaningful for her to have a filmmaker with the same disability behind the camera who understood the condition from a place of lived experience. There was no translation that was needed. Um, all of the things that she was going through, I had grappled with as well. And um, so I just think it, it made for a more honest and intimate and um, trusting atmosphere that really translates um, on screen. And I think people feel that in, in the power of the film. Thank you very much. Um, on this note of sort of thinking about authentic stories and lived experience, um, George, you've been really vocal about the importance of cultivating better and richer and like more interesting roles for disabled talent, as well as increasing accessibility across the industry. Uh, I can't remember what uh, outlet you did this interview for, but one of the things you pointed out was that it's sort of difficult to get your foot in the door of the business, so to speak, if you literally can't get through the doorway as a wheelchair user. <laughs> there's, there's a kind of, there are a series of accessibility barriers that sort of stop you from getting to the, you know, the ultimate barrier of creating an interesting character. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit about the work that you've been doing with ACTRA and, and also what it's been like fighting for accessibility behind the scenes at the same time as you're also working as an actor to create these fully fledged, interesting characters. Yeah. Um, thank you again. Um, no, uh, the work that I, I was doing with actor, like when I graduated uh, back in 2019, I never thought I was going to become an advocate at that, at that time. And then I got, um, approached by ACTRA to do an audit with them to talk about the accessibility of the casting houses in Toronto. Uh, because we have, we are known to be Hollywood North in a way where we do a lot of film and TV here. So it would be great to kind of see how accessible Toronto is for a wider range of talent. Um, and when we did the accessibility audits, I think not, I don't think a lot of people realize how inaccessible they really were uh, when it came to all of the different barriers that we have to face in the industry. And for me in particular, um, I, I have a fine line of, of when I want to be an actor and when I want to be an advocate. And I think that when I'm acting, it can be really difficult a lot of the time because when I'm going out for a job, um, especially for commercial work and um, anything on camera related, I tend to be put into that box of the guy in the wheelchair. And it, it, it's really, it's really a kind of a, um, a backwards way of thinking because, you know, you know, in the world of like, we're trying to be more inclusive to a lot more people. I think we're really backwards in a way in how we, kind of approach disability in media. And I think that the stigmas that we have as people with disabilities are caused from the media because we've never had proper representation. And I think that the more we normalize the everyday life of people, the more normal it will become in our society. And I think that um, what people don't get is like, why am I always playing a character that is centered around my disability and why can't it just be a character that happens to be in a wheelchair? Like, I just don't understand why that has to be the determining factor to why I'm getting a job or not getting a job and how, why it can't be my talent and my ability to, to do the job that 
will get me the work that I think that I deserve as an actor. Yeah. Um, Mustafa, I was wondering if you could kind of speak to this point as well about um, sort of being um, a visibly disabled performer and sort of having a really high profile role as a disabled character. As I mentioned earlier, you start in the first season of, of Black Summer. Um, it struck me watching the show this weekend, what a remarkably expressive performer you are and how that really becomes sort of central to the character and the way that your character communicates. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the casting process for the series and about really what unique qualities you think you bring to the show as a deaf performer. So not just, you know, transcending, you know, these limitations as a disabled performer, but really sort of channeling the fact that you are a disabled performer into this character. So what's, you know, what unique qualities do you think you bring to it? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. It is tough for me to really communicate 100% in the English process. Uh, It's not my strength. And so when I have an English script, I need that support uh, from people outside the deaf community, people that can go through and explain on the surface and in depth what's happening. Um, Not only to understand the character, but uh, the blocking and the staging so I know where to be and where to go. And when I have someone there that can do that, then I can integrate into the process faster. However, it's difficult to hire interpreters because it needs to be a professional interpreter. It can't be someone who has basic signing skills. I mean, I'm glad that they're learning and progressing, but when they don't understand what's going on, then I can understand what's going on. And when I have a muffled understanding of the process, I can't get what's needed. And so I definitely call out for the need for professional interpreters. And here in Regina, I have other friends that are deaf performers and deaf blind performers. There's a couple of individuals I'm thinking about. And they think about uh, the limitations they have as far as their sight or their hearing, and they get intimidated by how they're going to be able to function in that process. And we talk about how they're going to function with low vision, with all that's going to be required of them. And that really had an impact on me. Um, And I think when we talk about film, uh, specifically, I I know our industry is very focused on American film. You know, we, we look to Hollywood, that's Mecca. They're at the top of the heap. But here, Canada has so much opportunity. And we think, okay, if there is this opportunity, where is this opportunity? And I think it's important that we can support talent, especially disabled talent, uh, because yeah, it can be tough to find opportunities that's easier for other actors to find. And I think it's similar for other newcomers that don't have uh, really good access to English. And I'm talking about specifically Um, An organization, and the interpreter missed the name of the organization, but it's where Mm -hmm. actors often look to to find uh, job opportunities. It's completely in English. (laughs) And so it's not accessible, uh, and I wish there was more. Uh, I feel like a bit alone. I might be this one deaf actor, but I think that's because we have other deaf actors who maybe haven't been cast because the opportunity to even try out is not being offered to them. So my hope for the future is that we would be able to make the process accessible. Thank you. Right, to build off um, what both George and Mustafa were just saying, they were talking about um, barriers in terms of access, barriers in terms of the kinds of roles that are available to disabled performers, barriers in terms of challenges with blocking and staging in terms of hiring professional interpreters on sets in terms of, you know, language problems with how roles are listed in the first place and how representation is made available or not made available. 
Uh, I'm wondering, Chris, if you can speak to some of the challenges that you think disabled performers face in terms of booking roles, keeping roles, sort of getting their foot in the door in the first place. Well, unfortunately, the reality, I believe, is the stigma surrounding it. People look at somebody that has mobility issues, such as myself, or is an amputee. They say, oh, he walks funny. That wouldn't look good on camera. Oh, that person's in a wheelchair. Well, we need someone who can stand, you know, just certain things to where they're and I'm not saying everybody because I'm speaking very generally, but from my experiences when getting onto a film set, people know me as the amputee. They don't know me as Chris the actor. And where I would like to be viewed as uh, differently abled, it's what makes me unique, which is great. It keeps me in the mind of casting directors and everything because that's what makes me unique and everybody else here, what makes us differently abled. But then a lot of the time I'll get casted in horror movies when they need a gore scene of my leg being ripped off, you know? Looks great on camera, but sometimes we want something more enriching. And uh, in broadcast, uh, at CBC Toronto, where I work now, they are trying to break down the molds, or CBC Toronto. They're trying to break down the barriers of what it means to be differently abled and disabled. So they have a program called now the Kate Program, and uh, it's for anyone that identifies themselves with a disability, whether you're hard of seeing, whether you're in a wheelchair, uh, mobility issues, whatever. They have a hiring process to where they are specifically searching for people with disabilities to hire them on, and it's not just about a quota, right? They want to uh, bring different perspectives, because CBC is a growing company. They always want different perspectives when it comes to uh, different cultures, different backgrounds, and why not people that are differently abled. So I, it's a hiring process, and they don't guarantee jobs, but basically it's a way for people that are struggling with these barriers of getting in the field in some way or somehow to get into the door to meet people and hiring managers to be able to say, oh, they're capable of a lot more than I thought, right? So it's just a, it's an excellent way to get people that are differently abled into the business. And what Rodney is doing is great bringing awareness with his documentary. And George, you're doing great being an advocate, like standing up and being like, yeah, it's great. This is what makes me me, but I want more enriching roles and be that advocate, that voice for other people that are struggling. And that goes for Mustafa as well. So the the thing is, thankfully, the industry is growing and changing. We just have to be part of the change and make our voices heard and be like, we're here and we're underrepresented. It's our time now, please. All right. Thank you, Chris. I want to sort of ask a question for the panel that, that follows up on something that Chris was saying about um, thinking about his disability, something that makes him unique as a potential um, actor in different roles. Um, we've been talking about barriers, right, about challenges. And I think disabled people, cr disabled creatives, whether they're filmmakers or performers or critics or journalists, you know, whatever they are, this is something I think that naturally comes up, right? The kind of systemic barriers that, that there are that sort of keep us from participating fully in different ways. Um, whether it's, you know, a dearth of interesting stories out there, whether it's inspirational stories about disability that are made from people who are not within the disability community, um, uh, whether it's, you know, recurring limitations in terms of accessibility, in terms of economics. But I'm curious about what you think might, what unique benefits disabled performers and filmmakers might bring to the industry, given that these are perspectives that aren't really paid attention to as much perhaps within the industry. Like, what are some unique points of view, unique perspectives that disabled filmmakers and performers bring, do you think? And I'll, I'll sort of open it up to anybody who wants to answer the question. Um, yeah, George, go uh, ahead. Okay, I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, no, I I think that the one thing about what we have to offer is the fact that like we've lived an entire life or people may become disabled later on in their life, but um, but for people who, who have lived with it their entire life, we have a different worldly view of the world 
and how we kind of perceive things and how we kind of deal with things in, in our life. And I think that there is something really cool about the maturity that disabled performers have that a lot of able-bodied people may not get until much later in their life because we've had to deal with so much growing up that we don't really we, we had to grow up at a young age because we were already dealing with the crap that people threw at us at such a young age and you know when i when i was doing my program um what i didn't know and people didn't tell me until much later was that i was actually the first ever graduate in a wheelchair to ever graduate from any professional training program for acting in the in the country there was nobody ever before me according to multiple people that i've worked with and it uh it really opened my eyes to the fact that there's a lot of a lot of people that don't see us as valuable storytellers and i really think that we have a lot to offer and we are as beautiful and as enriching and as evocative and as whatever as able-bodied actors are and i think that it's our time to show how we authentically show our 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 stories i'm not i'm not the pity character i'm 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 much more than that and i don't live my life like that and i don't expect people to view me as that type of individual yeah you know i'll just i'll piggyback on what what george is saying and and you know just say coming from an, an intersectional perspective as a black queer disabled person I, i'm actually seeing things from multiple perspectives right so i'm so i'm bringing all of that to the table right so so i mean i think as a as a low vision filmmaker it's actually been an asset to me to actually not have peripheral vision because sets can be places that are filled, you know, with chaos and lighting rigs and, you know, all sorts of things that have nothing to do with directing and that have nothing to do with um, drawing emotion out of an actor. So for me, it's actually been really helpful to just say, you know, my job is not to, um, you know, uh, you know, take the lighting off of the actress's <laughs> head because she's got a halo. My job is to actually understand like where the performer needs to be at this moment in the story and what I have in my directing toolkit to get them there and to really focus on what they're doing in the moment. So ironically enough, like my disability allows me to block out all of the excess of the, the set that, that I don't need to be focusing on. There's only one person that's responsible for for what the actors are going to be doing in front of the camera. You know, it's it's and it's me, right? It, it, and usually people who walk out of the movie, they're not talking about the lighting. They're talking about whether the story moved them, whether the characters were compelling or not. And so those are like the central components of directing. So I just think we need to be nurturing the the talent pool of differently abled people um raising the expectations as someone who's also an educator i teach at swarthmore college in film production just building up the bench of the next generation to be able to tell these stories and have multi-dimensional characters that are you know fully fleshed out um human beings and that are you know compelling and that actors want to play that that are challenging for an actor you know of george's skill who's been you know trained at a specific school gone through a specific program they want those challenging roles and so you know when we're coming from a place where one in four people in society has a disability but less than two percent of characters in television and movies um, are shown having a disability, that's a huge disconnect in terms of like where we're at um, in terms of representation 
reflecting actual lived society. So I just think the bar needs to be raised in terms of the thinking about the people that can engage with these characters and these stories and just building up the pipeline, having talent agents and managers value disabled directors and actors and, and putting them out there the same way that they do with able-bodied directors and and actors. Um, so it's a change in mindset, you know, and and um, I think it's, it's you know, long overdue. Um, I want to sort of follow up on something that both um, Rodney and George have said. George, you were saying, you know, this is our time. Um, Rodney, you're speaking about sort of raising the bar um, and sort of, you know, passing on something more interesting to the, you know, next generation, perhaps, of disabled performers and filmmakers and kind of seizing this present moment. Um, I'm wondering about the moment that we're in right now, not to be too redemptive about this or falsely redemptive about this, but speaking as a disabled film critic um, and programmer, the past few years to me have seemed like something of a watershed in terms of the sheer number of good projects made by disabled filmmakers, starring disabled performers, um, authentic disability representation. I'm thinking, you know, certainly Rodney's film Vision Portraits is in that mix. I'm also thinking about things like Crip Camp. I'm thinking about Chain for Life, uh, Best Summer Ever was something that came out in recent months. Um, there have also been fellowships like Disability Futures, which, which Rodney was a fellow of, and the Accessible Futures Initiative at Sundance. And I'm wondering what we can make of all of these movements that are happening now and, and sort of where we find ourselves as a panel. Um, is disability having a, a positive moment in the industry right now where recognition is happening and talent is being cultivated? Is disability representation still lagging in spite of these seeming signs of progress? To sort of speak back to Rodney's point about your inherently intersectional POV, it seems to me that, you know, a number of these projects are still fairly white centered, a number of these projects are, are still fairly cis and fairly straight. Is there progress or is it kind of progress with a mix of regress and, and, and sort of where can we go forward from here? And, and, and what can we do collectively, do you think? I know this is a big question, but what can we do to sort of make sure that this isn't just a kind of trend or fad of the moment, but something that is lasting and that's something that the next generation can really deal with? Well, I mean, I'll just jump in because I've been involved in both of those programs that you mentioned that I think are, are fantastic programs and there should be more programs like that, um, especially in the U.S. I think there's like a dearth of those kinds of programs. And I, I do want to lift up the Ford Foundation. I do think that they, are, they really, um, you know, blew the whistle and, and really kind of um, tooted the horn for, for um, disabled artists and, and making us a part of the diversity conversation. And, and, and if it took a little bit of like shaming of other foundations, I don't think they were afraid to do that. You know, it's like we're doing this and we think that like disabled artists have a lot to offer. And would you like to join us in the initiative? What are you doing, you know, to actually build this this community up that we think um, has value and treasure that you're not seeing? And, you know, and so a little bit of it is is they put their money where their mouth is, right? So they started this Disability Futures Fellowship where 20 disabled artists, which included three filmmakers, myself, the co-director of Crip Camp, um, Jim Lebrecht and Tourmaline, who does more experimental films that play more in galleries, um, you know, and I, I, that, you know, I think was such a, um, a buoy to artists that received that fellowship and allowed us to, you know, make the kind of work that had a, a certain level of authenticity and didn't need to adhere to you know, somebody's standards of what they thought we should be making, right? And so similarly, the Accessible Futures program, is, you know, started out as an impact program with 
you know, three projects, Vision Portraits, Crip Camp, and another episodic series from our um, Argentina called Four Feet High that screened at Sundance and um, is about a wheelchair using teenager and her her sexuality, you know, something that I've never seen before, you know? And so I do think like it is this watershed moment, but I do think that more needs to be happening. I, I, I think that the number of foundations and nonprofits and institutes that are doing this in the U.S. can literally be counted on one hand. And I think it needs to be embedded within the Corporation for Public Broadcasting the same way that they have a multicultural alliance for black filmmakers, Asian filmmakers, um, Latina filmmakers, Native American filmmakers, there should be a pot of money to develop disabled talent, disabled filmmakers, um, to tell our own stories, you know, and, and that should be public funding. And so, um, you know, as coming from the U.S., that's my perspective on it, because um, I still think that there's a lot of shame and a lot of stigma within the industry. I can't tell you how many people emailed me after screenings of vision portraits telling me that they had low vision or had vision in one eye and worked as a filmmaker or worked as a graphic designer and were so afraid to tell anyone about it for fear of losing work or, you know, not being employed and how comfortable I seemed doing it. And it just, you know, it was just, you know, I have to bring my entire self into the room when I'm, when I'm coming onto a project and I'm not going to hide and I'm not going to, you know, you know, be filled with shame that I, that, that is nothing to be shameful about, you know? So I think more people, um, there need to be more opportunities. There need to be more people in positions of power, whether they're agents or managers or heads of studios or, or streamers, uh, you know, that are willing to open up those doors of opportunity. Um, I think that's really important. And I, you know, I, I, I do think that we have finally been offered a seat at the table for this diversity conversation, but I think we're just getting started. Yeah. And going off of that, um, I believe that coming from an actor's point of view, there is a huge um, misconception of, of, of how they cast an actor with a disability. And I think it, a lot of the time it's very performative. Um, you know, a lot of the time they, they're trying to check off a box of, look, we brought an actor in for a disability to read for a part, but they already have an actor in mind. I find that that happens a lot with American work when they come up to Toronto uh, to film, where they're trying to be diverse with how they, they, uh, they do an audition. But yet they bring they bring in an a, like an A list actor from Hollywood to play the part, and they never really um, actually look at the Canadian talent pool here in, uh, in Toronto or abroad in Canada. And I think that it's really quite apparent how performative and how much they do it to kind of cover their butt, but they don't actually do anything to actually do the work to create authentic storylines and have us involved from writing to to directing to everything to actually authentically create a story that can can um do it and i think too like what a lot of corporate leaders don't get and and studio heads and network heads and everybody is the fact that like the more out of the box you go with how you produce your own work the more of a crowd you're going to get because you're actually going to make money off of it because what it will sell because there will be more people that would want to watch them being represented properly on screen. And that was something I did not get growing up. That's a really interesting point. And, and I think we can just sort of look to the people on this panel. Like I'm thinking of the fact that Mustafa has a starring role in a in Netflix television series, you know? So thinking about looking at the Canadian talent pool, right? Like we have examples of it and it's a question of, 
keeping that momentum going, right? So that Mustafa can get additional lead roles rather than just sort of that being an interesting note that Netflix took a gamble once, right? Like what can we do to kind of keep that ball rolling instead of it just being, you know, a unicorn, a, a strange occurrence that happened and it was great and it was kismet. How do we make sure that we have these sustainable opportunities going forward for disabled performers? Um, I'll ask a, a sort of final wrapping up question that I think will sort of tie into some of the conversations we've been having already. Um, just to sort of leave us in a kind of brass tacks, practical sort of place. Um, what are some concrete changes that you think could be made, whether it's in Canada, whether it's in the United States, that would make the film and TV industries perhaps a more hospitable, creative space and welcoming space for disabled artists? We've we've had sort of conversations to this effect already. Rodney has talked about sort of putting your money where your mouth is. Um, uh, Mustafa has talked about, you know, hiring professional interpreters rather than just assuming things will fall into place. Uh, George has spoken about like actual concrete accessibility initiatives as well as better roles. Uh, you know, Chris has spoken about, uh, you know, making sure that the caliber of those roles is better and, and, and making sure that we have an awareness of disabled talent. I, I'm curious sort of what's on your wish list, all of you, for what you want to see the industry doing to sort of recognize disabled talent and make those spaces more hospitable going forward. And I'll, I'll throw the question open to everyone, but whoever wants to jump in and, and just sort of chime in. Well, I think it's important that audiences that go and see our creative content, such as movies, we underestimate audiences and people are drawn to authentic stories. So as an example with Mustafa playing a deaf character, organic deaf character in a TV show, people are more intrigued by that instead of just getting Brian Cranston sitting in a wheelchair. And the rock and skyscraper with a prosthetic foot, still jaded about that, but oh well, that's just me. <laughs> but I think people are, even though it's acting and it, you play pretend by telling the truth, but there's something more interesting about authentic characters that actually have those struggles and then portray that on screen. That's just the way I see it, but, and I think it plays the same with uh, people of color to get, like, Ryan Coogler to direct Black Panther. Like, if you try getting a white guy to tell that story, awkward, but <laughs> but that's just my vision on it, anyhow. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a complex question. I, I think that, um, you know, as I said, um, there is this multicultural alliance under the Corporation of Public Broadcasting. I do think there should be a branch for disabled um, filmmakers to to develop, produce, and complete those stories and have those stories in the pipeline. Those are those are tax dollars. You know what I mean. And you know the reason that that multi multicultural alliance exists is because people petitioned Congress because PBS wasn't reflective of the, the population at large. And so, so that's still the case in terms of, of disabled characters and disabled storylines. So I think that that's, that's definitely a tangible, um, uh, you know, thing that, that needs to happen where there's a pool of money that is nurturing disabled directors that are going to be writing, you know, the disabled characters from an authentic perspective and casting disabled actors and, and, you know, uplifting everyone. And, and yes, and I do think that it, that it is, um, uh, a money making move, you know what I mean? When when you have one in four people living with a disability, they do want to see the authentic rep representation. I think the days of like cripping up for Oscar are over. You know what I mean? I think that that's just like it's gauche. You know what I mean? And I don't think that. Um, things that you would do would have gotten by with 10 to 15 years ago, you can do now. I think, um, you know, casting directors know that there's, you know, that you do need to hire 
uh, an actor with cerebral palsy, it can't be faked, right? It's 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 a, a lived experience that they're going to bring to to the project. And if you do do it, you're you're going to get some pushback, right? There's, you're going to be lambasted, and it's not it's not going to be a good look for the project. So I do think that that people understand that with certain visible disabilities. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are some tangible steps that I think that could be made just from, from um, a monetizing perspective and from a casting perspective. Um, and, I, and I think, too, like, um, the, the one thing I would really enjoy and would really like is to have star power, like something that has never been given to actors with disabilities before. And it's starting to happen with Ali Stroker, um, the actor in the wheelchair uh, from New York. But um, I think that there is still a lot of work to, to do because with Ali, for example, the fact that when she won her Tony Award, she couldn't even, she had to go from backstage and she couldn't even go from the front. I like stuff like that. There's like, I feel like there, the, a tangible thing is to actually give us the opportunity to get to a level where we are celebrated in a way that like Meryl Streep or Tom Hanks would be celebrated. And I think that that is not given to us at all. And it's like, well, then why do I try if um, executives are not willing to kind of budge on their image of disability? Like the image is what I have a problem with. It's like, it's not, it's not the fact that we're telling stories or not or whatever. It's like what they're telling and how they're going about it. It's like the image of we are the, this type of, I don't know what it is, but it's like if you don't fit that image that you're too disabled or you're not disabled enough or this or that, they're not going to go your way. And I think that that is a tangible thing that we need to change to is the, is the notion of, of, star power and giving us the platform to actually build a proper career so we can be an advocate for the next generation of performers. So we got some good concrete suggestions so far. Um, it's gauche, move on from casting you know, non-disabled performers as disabled characters because you'll be lambasted. I like that as a sort of concrete suggestion. I think also because the, the project will be worse, right? And this is something that we've sort of seen you know, authentic representation is is better representation, not just because it is politically better, but because it is aesthetically better. Um, change the the notion of star power, allow disabled performers to have uh, a platform. Uh, what about you, Mustafa? Do you have any concrete sort of suggestions that you would make if you were sort of crafting your wish list of things for the industry to pay attention to, to make things better for disabled performers, to cultivate disabled performers in the future sort of what last words would you would you leave the industry with do you think oh i agree so much my my wish is that um uh, disabled individuals were able to have a place because as has been said they have a separate place in film they're that guy in the corner they're not part of the crew and with deaf culture we have our own little silo here and then there's the silo that belong to wheelchair riders and i think if it was not just the one-off in the corner the token representation if it were skilled actors that might happen to be disabled that had real roles and then people who had not yet been cast would see that there's a landing place for them that there's an industry that desires their talents and that actors can look like they do then it would be a welcome place and i think all of these are factors in bringing that thank you so much um i'm gonna wrap up our conversation there on that really evocative and powerful note uh from mustafa uh, I want to extend my sincere thanks to everybody on this panel. Thank you to Rodney and George and Mustafa and Chris. Uh, this has been a really lively conversation. I've learned a lot. Um, and I hope everyone who's watching has also learned a lot. And I hope that people are paying attention to these wish lists uh, and doing everything in their power to, to sort of help make those things a reality. 
Uh, so thank you all uh, for joining us today and, and happy festival.